I'm going to be talking uh, about bioliteracy, but in a little bit different way of what we've been talking about so far at this conference. And what bioliteracy means for me, uh, well, life for me, I'm a traditionalist. So for me, life is about species, and the language that I use is species names. And um, when I think of bioliterature, I think of species knowledge, so the basics, what they look like, where and how they live, what they stand for. And so the biodiversity product that I ident identify with is the field guide. And obviously there's, uh, there's a new urgency to um, collecting that kind of basic knowledge and sharing it. Uh, and we've heard a lot about it already uh, this week. Uh, obviously in many cases this is our last chance to obtain a lot of that information. Uh, and every little bit that we can add to human awareness of biodiversity is a gain for conservation. But of course, the really fun aspect of this urgency is that it was actually never easier to obtain and share that knowledge. And we've effectively seen several revolutions uh, in this process of uh, obtaining that knowledge. Uh, of course, it all started with human beings uh, being hunter-gatherers, observing stuff and giving it names. And then, of course, Linnaeus came around, and uh, the names that sort of give us access to knowledge of biodiversity, he put that into a classification system so that we could also structure the access. And then came, of course, the two great recent innovations, the genetics that uh, increased the objectivity and thus the stability of that system, and, of course, the informatics that helped improve the organization and the efficiency. But there always remained one big bottleneck, and that was, of course, that there are millions of species, and to have access to that knowledge to the with through that name and that structure, you need to know what you have. And it just boggles the mind to identify so many species. And we all know that once identification is easier, it becomes much more relevant to have all the other data. That's basically how you create your market. You have to have the access first. And we'll see, I think, more and more, also as there's more pressure on taxonomy, that the priorities will really be which groups can we make accessible fast and which groups have added value. And of course, now we've been talking all week about DNA barcoding, but there's another development that I'm very excited about. And that's image recognition or computer vision. So that is, uh, we all are familiar with these algorithms that are used to identify your face, to name you on, on Facebook, for example. And those same kind of algorithms can also be used to identify photographs of species. And you can just imagine how easy something like that would be for a butterfly, for instance, or a dragonfly. And for me, that is, is really going to be a major revolution in, in the coming years because Unlike barcoding, for example, this really emulates how we relate to animals and plants and other life by observing, by looking at them, by giving them name just on their habitus. So, and the, the beautiful thing is that there's something that really the taxonomic community can build around because we are the ones supplying the photographs. So there's a beautiful feedback loop that's going to occur, and this is really going to make a big difference for, for, many, for many groups. And I really think we're sort of going to go break through uh, in a kind of a lull that we've been for a long time where you've got several groups, vertebrates se uh, f uh, and, and seed plants in particular, that have a lot of work being done on them. And then, of course, all those groups that basically feel very ignored. And it was always easy to, to ignore invertebrates. They're small, there's too many of them. But now that could all change. And uh, that's good because we're losing our icons of conservation. So just imagine a world without pandas. What are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna rile people up to conserve? So it's gonna become more and more important that we have local, small, recognizable icons for conservation. And that's really gonna help here. And especially insects, you know, half of all species of eukaryotes, uh, at least according to some estimates, because of course, if we take the new estimates of fungi, it might all be different. But still, there are a lot of insects. These are really attractive groups that are at the moment uh, not applied to their full potential. Um, and of course, also nature is changing most where we know least about it. So just to put that in perspective, I like to come, I, I like to, to present it like this. 
if you just uh, imagine, we don't know how many species there are, of course, exactly on the planet, but if you just take one of those estimates and imagine the percentage of eukaryote species that have been described and express it as a fraction of the land surface on the planet, this green area roughly is the area that we have charted of the, of the living world. But then, of course, for most of these species, we know nothing. We, we, we've described it, and that's maybe all. Uh, what about the ecology? What about the distribution? What about the sort of basic knowledge that you need to have to know whether they're threatened or not? Well, only 80,000 species have been assessed for the IUCN Red List. So that is that fraction of the globe. And if that percentage of threat that's already found in that selection applies to all species, that's what it looks like. like. So I think you're sort of you know, seeing where I'm heading with this. We're very much in the same kind of situation as the conquistadors in the 15th century. They knew nothing about the world they were entering, but the ap apocalypse was certain. So what kind of groups are we going to do then? Well, I like this paper that uh, the father of biodiversity just came out just uh, earlier this, uh, this month. And he said, well, for conservation in particular, it makes sense to finish some of those groups that are quite close to completion. And I was very happy in his, in his quote to see uh, dragonflies and damselflies mentioned because that is the group that I work on. And of course, all taxonomists have to explain why is it relevant that we study your group. And, and for dragonflies, the argument is fresh water. We all know how important fresh water is. And the thing about fresh water is it is that, that fraction of active water on the planet that where all our crises basically collide. So the, you know, fresh water is possibly the most critical resource on the planet. It is, of course, the lifeblood of the climate. And it is also where the bi biodiversity crisis seems to be most extreme at present. So it all comes together in freshwater life. The only thing is that freshwater has an image problem. You only have to hear the slogan, drain the swamp, and you see, like, why does the swamp get the bad name? And the vast majority of life under the surface is, to most people, rather unspectacular, and it also includes all sorts of disease factors like mosquitoes. So freshwater just doesn't seem to have the icons that, uh, that terrestrial and, and marine habitats have, for example. So it also often very seems very easy to forget that 10% of, of animal species are found on, on less than a percent of the Earth's surface in this tiny, tiny area. So what's special about, about fresh water? Well, fresh water has this incredible superpower, and that is its self-cleansing capacity. Uh, the luxuriant life in fresh water is constantly cleaning up the system, and it's constantly being flushed through by precipitation. But of course, that, uh, as with every, every superhero, the strongest, uh, you know, the, the superpower is also always its weakness, and that is we are constantly impeding that resilience of, of fresh water by, basically we want fresh water to do everything at once. We want to water our fields, we want to use it as a sewer, but we also want to drink the water, we want to stick a dam in it so that we can contain the energy, and it just doesn't work like that. So then it's nice if you have a model group that sort of expresses that, that kind of resilience that, that fresh water has, that has that same kind of active cycle that appears also out of the water for us to see easily, that is able to fly, that can respond to change actively. And a group like that is, is the dragonflies. And what I personally like about dragonflies is that they're first about nature and second about humans. So, you know, it's not a group that, that helps us eat or that we eat ourselves. It is not a group that we, we fear or that we're worried about, about disease, or not even a group we study to know more about ourselves. It's purely a, you know, a group that stands for the beauty and the needs of nature. So what I've been doing uh, in the past 15 years is basically laying the foundation for African dragonflies, because I think, well, this is a fantastic group. This is a very good indicator group. This is a group that people can relate fresh water to, but to make that possible, I, you know, we have to know the basics. So we have to know uh, which species are threatened. We have to do the taxonomy. We have to do the barcoding. We need field photographs to get 
everything accessible. Of course, we need to do the red listing, and we've done that, and it was actually the first insect group for which a continental red list was actually produced. And for the past four years, I was in Stellenbosch and have been sharing all this data uh, with uh, support from the JRS Biodiversity Foundation. And um, first thing we did is use all the knowledge that we have of the distribution and of the status and of the ecology of the species to provide a simple index that people can use to assess for freshwater habitats. Uh, obviously, you can supply that kind of information, but then you also need to know what's going on in the background. So also a website with all the relevant information. And of course, users. And this, this meeting we organized, uh, a fresh the African freshwater entomology workshop. This was the first time that freshwater entomologists from all across Africa, so 20 different countries, actually came together and spoke with each other. Just let me get some water. So to bring all that, that whole story together, um, in 2015, I published this paper. The thing is, you know, I, it's very important to lay this foundation, but people that do that kind of work don't always feel appreciated. So I thought, you know what, I've been doing all this exploration in Africa, I'm finding all these new species, but I'm just never getting around to describing them. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to describe them all at once. So. In one paper, we described, to me and my two co-authors, uh, 60 new species, adding one new species to every 12 that was already known in Africa, to basically do away with three misconceptions, that is that most of Earth species are known, that unknown species are hidden and detectable only by genetics, and that enough effort is made to uncover the unknown in time. And to illustrate that, these species were found all across the continent, none uh, were noted first in the lab, so these were not cryptic species, and most, in fact, are recognizable from a photograph. And of course, every one of these species has its own exciting story of discovery. This species, for example, the first time I heard of it, someone sent me this very grainy photograph and asked me, what is it? And I said, well, it's definitely new, but I can't tell you. And much to my surprise, a quarter of a century later, thousands of kilometers away, we rediscovered this, we found this species. And it's actually widespread, it's very conspicuous, and the only reason why it's probably been ignored is because it flies in the wet season in fairly inaccessible forest habitats, but there it is. And as I said, it was all about sort of conservation, that was the, 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 the initial message, and I needed these names, I needed these species to be named, because if I didn't name them, I couldn't add them to the IUCN red list. I couldn't use them as indicators. I needed a label. And every one of these species has a story. And I'm not going to tell you all of those stories. Uh, but this for one, for example, is quite special. Uh, the Great Lakes of Africa are famous for these big radiations of fish. But they don't have radi big radiations of insect species because, of course, insects need to emerge out of the water. So they can't access that incredible diversity of niches. And this is actually a rare exception of a species that is endemic to uh, a lake, in this, cr uh, in this case, Tanganyika. And it's also very important to give good, memorable names, because these names are going to be used. And as uh, one citizen science once exclaimed to me, you don't notice them until you know they can have a name. So it's something that we need to think about when we name stuff to do it nicely. So for example, this is a species from, uh, this is not from the 60 New Species paper, but an earlier paper I did. Um, this was a species that was lost for almost uh, a century. It was already described in the 19th century, and it was rediscovered near Cape Town. We then, we then had the molecular material, discovered it was a, a distinct genus, and called it Spesbona. And Spesbona means good hope, which is the motto of the Western Cape province after the Cape of Good Hope, obviously. And maybe it helped a little bit because a second site was discovered this year by a citizen scientist. Uh, here's just another example of a nicely named species. Uh, this is a, a very uh, nice damselfly from Gabon. Um, these species of this family, they the males use their bright colors to impress females and, and rival males. And this, this species has three color forms. This is unique for males and African dragonflies. We have no idea why that is, but uh, uh, we still have to find out the ecology, but obviously you have to express that in the name. So it became Africocypha varicolor, the polychrome jewel. 
And of course, names can also grab attention, as for example, in this case, in the genus Amma, a friend uh, in already 15 years ago when I started exploration said, if you ever discover a new species of Amma, please call it after the Pink Floyd album, Amma Gamma, which is exactly what I did. And it even got me a top 10 new species mention in the following year. But of course, the message in the background that was so important to me is the importance of specialization, so of having biologists that know their groups. And the thing is that people often forget about, about, about biodiversity and about species names is that we're all doing it on trust. You expect me to be right, to know what I'm talking about, to know my species. But of course, if there's so little known, that it, you know, that's a big thing you're asking of me. And of course, I can only develop that expertise in the field. I can't develop it in the lab, I can't develop it in the, a little bit of in the collection, but in the end I need to go out. And you see how me and my, my two co-authors have been all over the continent to obtain this knowledge, to get this far. Oh. I thought I was helping myself. But that, of course, doesn't mean that barcoding wasn't incredibly useful uh, as a backup. And uh, in, uh, in Leiden, we're lucky to have the be best dragonfly collection in the world. It's very complete for African dragonflies. And uh, as part of the barcoding initiative uh, in Leiden, uh, dragonflies were a major group. Um, so uh, we've already um, uh, done about a third of the world species worldwide. But for Africa, there was a particular focus on it. So we had actually data for 80% of the tropical African species. So we could be have a really nice verification of the new species that I, I was finding. And um, CO1 really works well for, for dragonflies with about 91% of the morphologically identified species actually having unique haplotypes. And to give just one example of uh, verification in this case, here was a species uh, of which the male has an orange, uh, bright orange underside of the abdomen that it uses to lure uh, females into its territory. <coughs> and already in the 80s, uh, someone discovered that the males sitting in the sun have an orange underside of their abdomen, but the males sitting in th at the same streams in the shade have a black and yellow underside of the abdomen. But morphologically, they're identical. So that's that one. And then in Angola, we found another one with a slightly different uh, coloration on uh, the upper side. And of course, not very surprisingly, the barcoding information supported those groups, and these species could then be described. But in the end, you still need these guys that know their stuff, that actually know what to collect before you barcode it. And here are you know, two examples of species that if you don't have the expertise, you wouldn't have picked up that these were different. And the thing is, I think that many people in the public think that this is exactly what biologists do. They go out and discover species. You know, they're very adventurous type of biologist. But if you look at, at this particular study, just as an example, these 60 new species, 33, so three specialists found these species. And if you just look at every species and what the role of that individual was when they discovered that species, of those 60 species, 33 were discovered while that individual was working as an environmental consultant. 18 of these species were discovered by th this gentleman in the top right, uh, a French uh, school teacher who just goes out as a hobby catching dragonflies uh, in the weekend. And then only nine of these 60 new species were actually found by someone, me, uh, while uh, being employed by a university or museum, which is sort of where we think this kind of work happens. And unfortunately, none of them were discovered by African specialists simply because we haven't trained them yet. They don't exist. And this is sort of the, the, the image that I show to sort of explain the core of the problem. This is how you know, many biodiversity institutes and natural history museums are organized. There's those three elements. There's the science, there's the public uh, aspect, there's the collections. But the problem is, of course, if you separate those too much and they're chasing different goals, um, the species knowledge that has to be built up gets forgotten. And if you're chasing grants and high-impact papers, you might not have time to write a field guide as a scientist. 
if you are just trying to keep your head above water with preserving the, the thousands, the millions of specimens that have already been collected, you're not really interested in expanding the collection. You just don't have time. You want to, but you don't have time. And of course, with the public, if you know, the focus is on drawing the big crowds with dinosaurs, which is of course important, but then there might not be time left to think of the more specialized public, you know, the, the, the nature enthusiasts, the environmental consultants and such. And so that's how you get the erosion at the heart. And that is a problem because biology to me is, a, is it like a tapestry. You basically have the warp, and those are the lines that you put on the board, the different specialties, the people that are just plodding on, describing and getting to know the different plant species, the insect, the fungi, the mollusks, the birds. And then you have all the applications, the interest, the economy, the research, the conservation, the education that is woven on that warp. And the, the, the broader you make that warp, the broader the applications are. But of course, if you start pulling out those threads, biology unravels. And so for me, the highlight of this whole phase of, of, of describing species was that I was asked after these 60 new species um, to represent uh, my field uh, during the celebrations of David Attenborough's 90th birthday. And the BBC asked me, can you please, he loves dragonflies, can you please name a species after him and present it to him? And that also gave me the opportunity to sort of share this message that I'm sharing with you now uh, in, this, uh, in this commentary in nature. So if you, if you sort of like what you hear, please, please read that. Because in the end, of course, that is what we're all about. We, we build up that species knowledge so that people can develop a sense of species, that they understand what is our place within biodiversity. And I think uh, that all the innovations that we've been talking about, the barcoding and all the others, are really, you know, often policymakers think that they're replacing, and, and also often taxonomists are afraid. They think they're being replaced, but actually they're only becoming more and more important. So the innovation bears rather than fills the gap in species knowledge. You know, we're needed more and more to provide input, obviously in DNA barcoding and computer vision, uh, to support the expanding citizen science. Of course, to run the ground operation uh, for urgent exploration of life. And uh, perhaps most importantly, to validate and interpret the deludes of emerging information. Because the thing that people often don't understand about expertise of particular groups is not, not so much about what you already know, but it's what you know about what we don't know. It's it's having the access to those groups, knowing where the gaps are, knowing what hypotheses might be there. That is most important. Thank you. Thanks for the one, one, wonderful talk. How would you assign the species name to the organisms rather than uh, the varieties? Because uh, I think there should be some definition for this. Sorry, I don't know exactly your question. Yeah, for example, you have a dragonfly with a different eye color. You assign different species for the two. Mm -hmm. But why not two varieties instead of two species? Uh, well, I think like, like, like most taxonomists, um, you look at uh, a variety of data, you look at molecular data, you look at morphological data, you look at ecological data, you look yeah. at geographic data, but at the end of the day, it's your call. Okay. It's, it's subjective. At the end of the day, you just take the, the, the evidence you have, um, especially in insects. In many cases, you might have only one specimen. Yeah. Um, so at the end, of and, th and that's why I was making this point about trust. At the end of the day, people forget how important trust is. You know, it, it's quite different, you know, from other sciences taxonomy. It, it, it's it's a much more, uh, you know, Fingerspitzengefühl is the German word. You know, it's it's much more about intuition, because you have to deal with the with the with the often fragmentary evidence that you have. But mm. but you have to charge on because you need to have the tool. You need to have the communication. You need to have the access. Mm. And that is why. Experts like myself and many in this room are so important because they are the people we trust to, to, to get it, mm. right? To, to, to be able to make that subjective call. Uh, 
Okay, very nice talk. This is this actually also is to Eric a little bit. So how do you recon the fact, okay, all of this work is basically being done from the outside. Okay, so not really in the countries where this biodiversity is. How do you know, how do you reconcile it, but also how do you convince the governments, okay, of these, you know, of all the countries, I'm talking about South America as well, okay, and you know, whatever, Asia as well, to really invest in these types of studies, because that's the only way I think you can actually get a handle on this biodiversity and avoid all the problems with the, you know, Nagoya Convention, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I can give you an example of that. Um, so I um, had the brief uh, slide about the, the project I did in Stellenbosch, so basically, which is about, yeah, exactly. I can say this is a wonderful indicator group, but if I don't supply the knowledge, it's never going to develop as such. So that's what the project was about. And as you saw, it wasn't only about providing the data, but it was also about inviting people to, to get to, let me just please f to finish, the, finish that. And of course, I had delegates coming to me asking me exactly that question. And, and for example, there were Nigerian delegates that, that asked me that. They, and I said, well, at the moment, um, there's so much development ha happening in Africa with mining, for example, and, and hydropower. And um, at the moment, all the consultants that have to do the, the, do the environmental impact assessments, which in many cases you know, are also required by African law, just like we're used to in Europe, um, are, are being flown in from Europe at astronomic costs. So I said, well, there's a very simple argument here to develop that kind of knowledge because they can get, they can get the same expertise cheaper within their own country. And th with this argument, they went to the Nigerian Science Foundation and got money to do barcoding of Nigerian dragonflies. So the argument does, I mean, obviously we have a long way to go, but, but these are kind of arguments I think you need to make. I mean, maybe Eric can, can, can give a, a second example, but I think this is a fairly, a fairly good one. The, the same applies to many of the problems around small mammals and the diseases they carry is the same. If you don't have local experts that can tell you what species are carrying what, of course they are not necessarily the ones who will discover what species is carrying what disease, but they might be very instrumental in knowing where to see them, where to find what the ecology of the animals is and how they interact eventually with humans and our potential for contaminating uh, society for humans. So it is indeed very important. I mean, we have to make sure that this expertise is not only on paper or on the internet in a DNA barcode, but that somebody down there on the ground knows what it actually means for people who are living in the wild very often or in, or in areas where the wildlife occurs. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Uh, the reason why most people use backcoding is because it's fast and probably cheap. I don't know, for dragonflies, how long do you take, for example, to identify 60 species? For the me, it, well, it depends. Like, these 60 new species, I mean, I didn't discover all of them personally, but a, a, large, a large number of them I did. And as I said, because I wanted to make the point that even in a group that is as well known as dragonflies, dragonflies are supposedly, well, I didn't give you the number, but dragonflies are, you know, of course we know that most insects are poorly known. But dragonflies is one of those exceptions, and we say we probably know 80% of the species. But that even there, if you have someone who actually knows this stuff and goes, you know, spends a few years in the field, it's very easy to find new species. And all of these, that to make that point, I made sure that all the species I presented were recognizable on the spot. So I knew when I collected these species, I knew they were new instantaneously because I'm familiar with the species. I've been told, I've seen the holotypes. Uh, I've seen many of the other species in the field, but that is because I've, you know, I've invested years and years uh, of this, of this, you know, in, in this kind of work. Obviously, uh, if you were to start today, uh, it's going to take you a while to, to build up that knowledge, but eventually uh, that is possible. But that's also why I'm excited by these tools like this image recognition uh, software, because then I can, you know, if I can supply 40 photographs of every species, uh, and the algorithm teaches itself to separate between them. Ma maybe it doesn't separate the two most similar species, but then you would have an application that would tell you, well, I've uh, narrowed it down for you. It's not, I you don't have to guess anymore which one of these 800 species it is. It is one of these two. 
check the characters. And then uh, you can go and look in the literature and say, well, I don't, I don't trust this. I think this is actually a third species, so I think I've got something new. So, you know, with these kind of tools, we can speed up that process, you know, so that people can learn faster. And, it, you know, once they, once they can identify the species faster, they can do the interesting stuff. They can do the evolutionary research. They can do the conservation applications. That is the idea. Is that too elaborate an answer? <laughs> Partly. Yeah. Okay, yes, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>